I ask you to take your Bibles and turn to Mark 9. Mark chapter 9, if you would. Today, um, before we get started today, I, I was informed that uh, one of our young ladies had a birthday today, Miss May. Happy birthday, Miss May. Yeah. Miss May will be driving the bus tonight to Team, to team Impact. So, uh, um, so good to uh, so good to Miss May to have you with us and just being the foundation you are at this church. This is one of my favorite passages in the Bible. It really is. Uh, I've referred to it numerous times, but never really preached specifically in Mark chapter nine. I have preached from Matthew seventeen or nineteen. I think it's chapter seventeen. And Matthew 17 is the same story. There's a little bit of difference in the parallelisms, but it's the same story. But I've never really focused on dissecting Mark chapter 9, which ironically, again, is my favorite passage in the New Testament. We've talked a lot through Matthew. We talked about the Father and His position for His Son. We talked about the, the healing power of Christ. And we, we talked about the, the disciples questioning their lack of ability and, and Jesus' response when He said, these things can only happen through much prayer. And, and we're not going to even get to that particular passage tonight. But uh, have you ever felt in your life when you looked around that everybody seemed to be strong in their faith but you? You ever looked at some people and thought, man, they just got it all together. Nothing can shake and rattle them, but it seems like time and time again, maybe you're in this crisis of faith. You found yourself sometimes just in a spiritual debilitating stupor and, and you just wonder how you can get out of that. And, and, and you know, what we do sometimes is we fail to realize when we see people, oftentimes people are really good, like myself sometimes, to put it on. They don't have it all together like we think they have because the truth is sometimes people may look at you and think, wow, she's got it all together or he's got it all together. But in reality, we are very dysfunctional and weak at the time. And I think the reason for that is that we, we're all good at pretending sometimes. You know, we, we go to church and, and maybe we've, we've had a, a shaky week or a difficult time or an argument with our spouse. And, and, you know, we walk through the doors and we walk through the doors and we walk through like this. And we open the doors and we're like this. Hey, how are you? it's all good. Yeah, it's good to see you. God bless you, sister. God bless you, brother. Praying for you. And we put on this persona. Because that's what we're supposed to do at church. At least that's what we think sometimes. Reality is sometimes we come to church and we're completely exhausted. Sometimes we're completely broken. Sometimes we have to drag ourselves out of bed just to get to church. And, and really and truly, when people around us are singing, how marvelous, how wonderful, and, and we're, we're singing the words, but we really just can't grasp the meaning that God is that good. I've been there at times. The truth is, sometimes my faith is weak. Sometimes I struggle. Let's be honest, sometimes we, we really love God and... And we want more than anything to God to, to work in our life, but we're at a point of weakness where we feel like we're helpless. Introduction of this passage, before I read it, is very important because in this particular passage here, Jesus had left the majority of the disciples at the base of a mountain. What mountain? Many people may ask, and, and you know, many people believe it's Mount Hermon because of the geographic location of Philippi and where they were at the time. We don't know, and really that's irrelevant right now. But it was a mountain, and, and although most commentators say it's, it's Mount Hermon, we'll just say it was a mountain. And when they went on top of the mountain, Jesus took three of his choice disciples, the same one he carried, same ones he carried a little deeper into the garden with him to pray. And something ex Extraordinary happened. The Bible says while they were on top of the mountain that the voice of God revealed Himself and that Jesus for just a moment He changed out of His earthly body into His glorified body. And, and He said he, there was just such a, a 
passion, a presence in this glorified body, that Elijah appeared and Moses appeared. Now, don't get lost in this, and let's read through it. Can you imagine the experience of seeing Jesus being transformed, even but for a moment, from the flesh that you had known Him, the time that you have known Him, to the supernatural glorified presence that we're all promised at some point in our life? And not only that, to recognize two of the greatest Old Testament heroes, Moses and Elijah, appear to you after they have been gone for many, many years. And then to hear the tangible, audible voice of God speak on behalf of the Son. It was unbelievable. I cannot even begin to describe what it must have been like. The Bible says they were so enamored by it that they, they, Peter said, hey, can we, can we build a, a church here? Basically what he said, can we build a monument here that way everybody can come here and pay tribute? And he said, no, 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 that's not what we're going to do. Why did he do that? Because it changed them. I mean, you've been to a camp or, or maybe a revival service or maybe you've heard a song where it just did something to you and it just changed you. And I mean, you're like, I don't want to leave this place. I don't want to leave the presence of God right now. That's exactly where they were. And then they came down from the mountain in verse number 9. When they came down from the mountain in verse number 9, we're going to pick up in verse number 14, and I'll read this through 24. When they returned to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd surrounding them, and some teachers of religious law were arguing with them. Kind of interesting how it really just falls into place with us. You know, you, you go, you ever have those times where you just have a great church service or a great experience with the Lord? I mean, just a supernatural, crazy experience with the Lord, and you walk out and you feel like you're on cloud nine and everything's just going good, and then you run into a problem. You, you ever had that? I mean, be honest with me, okay? You, you just felt so clean, refreshed, just on top of the world, and you get a phone call, or your spouse acts up, or your children act up, and you go from here to here just like that. I don't even know why I try anymore. These guys went from the mountaintop experience and they crashed at the bottom. When they walked down, they saw the disciples and the crowd and the religious people. Everybody was arguing about something. Jesus, in verse 15, it says, when the crowd saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with awe and they ran to greet Him. I love that. There was chaos, there was anger, there was animosity, there was hatred, there was arguing, there was confusion. But when they saw Jesus, they just ran to be a part of Him. You know, it's unbelievable that I have the ability to rest in Jesus every day and oftentimes I choose not to do that. One of the men, no, Jesus asked in verse 16, what is all this arguing about? What are you guys doing, He said. Why are you arguing? Why are you fussing? And look at this, verse 17. I love this. One, out of all the religious people, out of all the disciples, out of the whole group that was gathered there that day, one, one of the men in the crowd spoke up and said, Teacher, I brought my son to you so you could heal him. He's possessed by an evil spirit that will not let him talk. And whenever that spirit seizes him, it throws him violently to the ground. And then he foams at the mouth and he grinds his teeth and he becomes rigid. So I asked your disciples to cast out the evil spirit, but they couldn't do it. That's pretty tough right there, guys. You got that? Did you get what he just did? He just called them all out. He said, Jesus, I mean, think about this. This whole crowd, all of us are here today. We're all arguing with each other. They're all complaining. Somebody's right. Somebody's wrong. Jesus walks in. He, demand, he demands our attention. Everybody turns to Him. The Bible says they all rend Him. They surround Him. But only one person has guts, the strength, the desire to step out of the crowd. And He said, Jesus, I brought my Son to You. As a matter of fact, I brought my Son to Your disciples first. And they couldn't do anything about it. Now, I don't know about you, but if I was a disciple, I'd feel pretty bad right there. Right? Wouldn't you, wouldn't you feel pretty bad? I mean, can you imagine them saying, well, you know, I brought it to all the deacons and they couldn't do anything about it. We'd be like this. Oh, okay. You know, we'd do like, I'd step out of the crowd and go, I'm glad I'm not one of those deacons. 
I brought them to the disciples and they couldn't do it. These are supposed to be powerful men. The church, people oftentimes come to church looking for answers to the problem and they get so discouraged because they can't find an answer in the church because the church is filled with people just like them who has problems of their own. They carried them to the disciples and the disciples had their own arguments and own problems and they couldn't do anything about it. So let's look and see what happens. Verse 19, Jesus said to them, look at this. He didn't say to the Father. The Bible says Jesus said to them, to the whole congregation, you faithless people. See, this is the problem right here. The problem was the lack of faith. The problem was the lack of belief. The problem was we say with our mouth we believe, but oftentimes our lives we struggle in what we believe. Let's be honest, okay? We say that when someone goes through a difficult time, we say, just pray about it. God will answer you. But when we go through a difficult time, isn't it a little more hard to do and apply to our lives? It is for me. It's a lot easier for me to say I'm praying for you when you're going through a difficult time and trust in God than for me to trust in God when I'm going through a difficult time. And Jesus said to them, you faithless people, how long must I be with you? He's frustrated. He had just been in the presence of the Father, transformed back to the glorious form in the presence of two of the greatest heroes of the Old Testament. It was an unbelievable experience for everyone there. And then he comes down to this faithless group of people. And he says, how long have I got to be here with you? How long must I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. There's a lot of power in that statement, guys. So they brought the boy, who when the evil spirit saw Jesus, it threw the child into a violent convulsion, and he fell to the ground, writhing and foaming at the mouth. How long has this been happening, Jesus said. He replied, since he was a little boy, the spirit often throws him into the fire, into the water, trying to kill him. Have mercy on us and help us if you can. He said, Jesus, if you can help me, I really need your help. You don't have to raise your hand, but I wonder how many of you and how many times I've been in that spot where we said, God, if you can help me, I need some help. Look at the response to Jesus. He says, what do you mean if I can? I just asked the question, how long have I got to put up with you? How long have I got to be with you? You have heard about me. That's why you're here. Do you realize that? That man did not show up because he was looking through the newspaper and saw the disciples were in town and he wanted to go see them that day. That man had heard about the power of Jesus Christ and he had tracked him down and he had found the disciples of Jesus even though Jesus was not with him at the time and he went to the disciples for healing. He couldn't find it so he waited for Jesus. He was there not by accident. He he was there because he had purposed in his plans to find Jesus because he heard that Jesus could heal. And then he says, if you can help me. But before we beat him up, I have been that man more than I have not been that man. There have been many times in my prayer life I have prayed with a question mark. Lord, will you bless me? Lord, will you be with me? Lord, will you give me wisdom? And we can just go on and on. And everything is a question mark instead of a statement of faith. And Jesus says, are you kidding? What do you mean if I can? Jesus asked. Anything is possible if a person believes. The contemporary English version uses the word anything is possible if you have faith. Most other versions use the word believes as well. Look at what he says next. The father instantly cried out, I love this. This is me. Look at this. Read this. Study this. Circle this. Put it, tattoo it on your brain. Look at this. He says, the father instantly cried out. He recognized he was standing before the presence of God. And rather than lie and rather than try to be somebody he's not, the father instantly cried out in desperation and discouragement after years of treatment sought, after years of sleepless nights, after years of wondering if his son was going to see another year, after years of one discouragement after after the next, in desperation, he says, I believe who you are. That's why I'm here. Because I've heard about you. Because I've seen the results of you passing by. I believe you. But help me overcome my unbelief. Love that statement. That's me. That's who I am. 
God, I believe in you. I know you can do it, but there's a side of me that's humanistic. There's a side of me that's grounded by the sinful nature of this world. And even when I pray, Lord Jesus, there's times I pray knowing who I'm praying to, but I'm struggling with doubt. I'm struggling not that you can't do it, but I just really can't give it to you to do. Help me with my unbelief. And then verse number 24. Oh, that was 24, I'm sorry. When Jesus saw the crowd that goes on to say that Jesus brought the boy, he healed the boy, and the disciples said, how come we couldn't do it? And Jesus said, these things can only come through much prayer. I want to share with you just a few points today because there's been times in my life where I know God. Listen, I want to confess to you, I know God. I know that today if something were to happen to me and I would leave this world, I know based on the promises of God, not through anything that I have seen or heard, but through the promises of God, and that's all I have, is that there's a life better for me. That I know today, just like the young person that we laid to rest here in our church yesterday, that she's with God today in a glorified body. I know that when I leave this world, I'll be with God according to His promises. I believe that God's Word is true. I really have seen God's Word change the lives of people. But there are times in my life when I struggle, when I'm praying. There's times in my life when I'm looking to God and there's a part of me that struggles with full faith. That's what this father said. He said, God, I believe you. If not, I wouldn't be here. There's a part of me that just really doubts. Have you ever been there before? Have you ever prayed about something that you were so passionate about and you know God can do it, but there's a portion, there's a part of you, it may be a small part, it may be a great big part that still doubts. So today I want to focus on that phrase, Lord, I believe you, but help me with my unbelief. Would you just pray with me, Father? We're teaching your word today. And God, as we teach your word today, Lord, please teach us a valuable lesson. There are sometimes I look around, and I see great men and women, and I go, wow. They got it all together. They never doubt. They never struggle. They never have bad days. And Lord, they're probably looking back at me and thinking the same thing when there's the reality. And the reality is I find myself like that father in chaos and turmoil, overwhelmed by the days or the weeks or the months or life's events, feeling like I'm going to sink and never surface again. And I'm praying, but even in my prayers, there's that doubt, there's that humanistic fleshly doubt that chokes the very life of my faith. And Lord Jesus, I can either pretend like it's not there or like that father today in desperation cry out and say, God, I believe you, but there's times the unbelief creeps in and I need you to help me through those crises of unbelief. Please teach us in these next few moments together. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Would you hold on tight because I want to give you some quick points today. First of all, I want you to understand that people are always looking for answers. I do believe that. This past week on the way to visit someone in uh, that pit memorial, I got a message from my wife that shared with me that a young lady, Rebecca Winston, had passed away. As soon as I got the message, I called her dad. I said, I'll be over there as soon as I get back from Greenville. Go back to Greenville when I sat in the home. I said, I have no answers. I don't. I can't answer the question why. I don't know why. I have no words that I can give you today that's going to give you any comfort or any peace. I can tell you that it's going to be painful, but you already know that. I can tell you that you're going to cry, but you're already doing that. All I can do is just sit here with you. I just want to pray for you. And anything you want to share with me, anything, if you want to get mad, whatever you want to do, I just want to sit here and be with you here right now. You know why? Because people are looking for answers. And oftentimes they're looking for you and I, the church people, to give them the answers that they need. And the reality is, like this, we don't always have the answer. You know, sometimes the best thing we can do as ministers, and we talked about that in our class this morning, every one of you are ministers. The best thing we can do sometimes is listen and acknowledge, I don't know what to say. Sometimes when people go through it, they don't want a list of steps to take in order to get better. They just want somebody to hear them out and maybe to pray for them. People are always looking for something. I guarantee you today that most everybody in this sanctuary today is either looking for answers or know someone that is. You're going through a difficult time. Someone you know is going through a difficult time. And we want closure. We want answers. And we're searching and we're searching. And oftentimes the more questions we ask, the more discouraged that we get. It says in verse 14 that a large crowd had surrounded them. Why? Because people are looking for answers. Look at verse 15, though, it says, when they saw Jesus. 
They were overwhelmed. Big Daddy Weaves got a song that says, I see the work of your hands, galaxies spin in heavenly dance. Oh God, all that you are is so overwhelming. I hear the sound of your voice all at once. It's a gentle and thunderous noise. Oh God, all that you are is so overwhelming. I delight myself in you, captivated by your beauty. I'm overwhelmed. I'm overwhelmed by you. God, I run into your arms unashamed because of mercy. I'm overwhelmed. I'm overwhelmed by you. Can I tell you something, guys? And, and I mean this, and it may sound almost juvenile, but sometimes we have got to train our minds and our eyes to stop looking at those around us and start searching for the Jesus that's inside of us and be overwhelmed in His presence. Because when you look around, you get discouraged. You may be getting discouraged because somebody's not including you. You may be discouraged because someone's speaking ill towards you. You may be discouraged because someone's got it better than you. And we look at others and we become overwhelmed and discouraged. But when we keep our eyes focused on Christ, and you say, how do you do that? I believe that. Can I tell you there's only one way? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. The only way we can keep our eyes on God is not by looking at what somebody else is doing, but looking what He is saying into our lives. I was reading Proverbs yesterday, I think it was, and it says that I continually feed my life with trash. That's what I'm going to get out. They were overwhelmed when they saw the presence of Jesus. And in verse 15 it says they ran to Him. People do not come to Parkwood for me or anybody else. Most people are looking for answers. And I want to tell you the only answers that we're going to have that's going to create a feel in the void of our hearts is Christ. Please understand that. Listen to me. I'll make a very dumb analogy, but you'll understand what I'm saying. I drive a Ford truck. You know what? I put gas in that Ford truck. That's not very scientific, is it? It's not very ingenuitive that I can say that to you today. I put unleaded gas in an unleaded truck. If I pulled up to sheets this afternoon and I took uh, diesel gas or I, or I put uh, uh, kerosene in my truck, you know what would happen before too long to my truck? It would be incapacitated because my truck is created to focus, to fully ride and, dr and thrive on unleaded gas. Anything else I put in there may seem to be okay for a little bit, but it's going to completely destroy that which it was created to do. Do you understand that God has created us for fellowship with Him? And we constantly put things in there that we're not designed to embrace and hold on to. We constantly allow our minds and our spirits to be saturated by negativity and we walk through life to defeated and discouraged because the very thing we were created to fill ourselves with, that God-sized hole, we refused to fill our spirits with. They ran to Him. Everybody is looking for an answer. Look, number two is down in verses 17 through 18. A broken man appears. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but I want you to get the gist of what he's saying here. One of the men in the crowd spoke up. Let that sink in for a moment. There were probably several hundred people there that day. Everybody had an issue. But only one person was willing to go the extra mile. You know what that teaches me? It teaches me several things. It teaches me that some people love to do more, like me, I'll be honest with you, some of us like to do more complaining than resolving. Everybody was there. They were grumbling. They were arguing. They were complaining. But when Jesus came, they were all struck. They were overwhelmed, the Bible says. And they all surrounded Jesus. But only one spoke up. Only one spoke out and went to Christ. Many of us today may be going through some difficult times in their lives. I have been in my life going through some difficult times. And I complain and I talk about them and I wallow in them. And the only thing I know I need to do is go to Jesus. But I refuse to do that sometimes. Only one person was willing to step out and go to Jesus. One man in the crowd spoke up. How many times have you and I been silent before God when we should have spoken up? I want you to listen to the statement, no one in the Bible, no one in the Bible ever accomplished great things by blending in. There was an entire group of men on one side of a valley and they were shaking, the Bible says, in their tents. Grown men trained to do battle. And one shepherd boy spoke up and stood out and because of that he became one of the greatest leaders in the Old Testament, David. 
There was an entire group of Hebrew children that were taken captive, but only four stood up and said, I am going to stand firm on God. And they went through great persecution, but changed the face of an entire nation because those four young men stood out. Do you understand that one harlot, one common street walker, stood out amongst the entire crowd, and because of that, her family was saved. Because she was the only one that stood out. What is it going to take for you and I to stand out? Let me explain what I mean by that. Stop wallowing in what's going on. Stop complaining to others who are in the same situation and cannot bring any resolution. The most simple and elementary thing I can tell you today is go to Him. But you say, I go to Jesus sometimes and I don't feel like I get the answer I want. I go to Jesus sometimes and I don't feel like He hears me. I go to Jesus sometimes and I just don't feel like I'm accomplishing anything. Can I say this to you? If you're a child of God, there's not a thought you can conjure up that He's not fully aware of. So don't limit God's ability by your lack of expressiveness in sharing your, your brokenness. But look what he did very quickly. He didn't come on behalf of himself. He came on behalf of his son. I'm not going to spend any time on that. But just to tell you that sometimes it may not be us that's in a difficult way. Sometimes it may be others that we need to intercede for. Number three, Jesus recognizes the problem in verse number 19. He says, you faithless, you disbelieving generation. Have you ever been there before? Guys, let's be honest just for the next few moments, okay? Then we're going to go. Have you ever sung the song of how marvelous or great are you, Lord, but in your heart of hearts you really kind of question that? Has there ever been a time in your life when you prayed and you prayed and you prayed, but in your mind you really doubted if the answers would ever come? Jesus asked two simple questions. He says, how long? How long must I be with you? Have you ever been accused of something and you said, you know me better than that? You responded like that? Well, come on, you know me. You know I wouldn't do something like that. That's what Jesus is saying basically. So we can't get any answers. We come to church and we can't get any answers. We go to the disciples and all we see is people arguing, Can you know, what, what's happening? And Jesus says, you know me better than that. Are you serious? You're asking me. You're asking me this question and this belief. How long will I put up with you, he says? How long will I suffer with you? I'm going to make this statement and then I'll move on and get to the meat of it. I am oftentimes more the problem than I am part of the resolution. Look at Jesus' response very quickly in verse number 19 through 22. Jesus says, bring the boy to me. How long has this been happening? He, he says, first of all, it shows interest and concern. He's concerned about the condition of the boy. He's concerned that this boy's been going through this. How long has this been happening? The father just broke and said it's been happening for a long time. And Jesus says, bring this boy to my presence. Bring him straight to me. Let me just say this right here on this particular note. And Jesus acts, and I can't explain it, but Jesus actually cares about what you're going through. How many of us today, you don't have to raise your hand. I, I have. I'll raise my hand on behalf of us. How many of us at some point in our life have felt like even Christ didn't care about us? But he does. Jesus says, how long has he been going through this man? The father said ever since he was a little boy. And Jesus said, I want you to bring him to me right now. Jesus said, these things can be accomplished if you just believe. And here's where we're going to tie it all together. There's times where Jesus can, even though I can't. Let me explain what I mean by that. There's a movement called the faith movement that believes that I have to have faith in order for God to move. There may be a little truth to that. I need to have faith in Christ, but God's power is not limited to my faith. Do you understand that? 
I've actually heard a pastor say one time that the reason why the, the angel struck Zechariah's voice silent is because if he stepped out, his lack of belief would hinder God from bringing John the Baptist into the world. How ludicrous is, is that? My faith does not determine God's power. It was written long before I was even a fault. And this is living proof of this. If there have been times in my life where my faith was destitute, where my spirit was broken, where I felt like I could not go on anymore, and God is still capable of doing abundantly more than I could ever hope for. Elijah sat under the tree after one of the greatest victories over Old Testament false doctrine, and he said, God, kill me, strike me dead. I don't want to live. I don't want to see tomorrow. I'm sick of this life. I'm completely discouraged. And God ministered to him in his weakest point. Even though Elijah's faith was weak, God is still strong. There are times in your life when you're weak. There's times in my life when I'm weak and I feel like I cannot go on anymore. I've got that question on my heart that the Father had. God, if you can, if you can help me, I still question God as much as I know about God. I still doubt Him. And even during those weak times, God still cares about me and loves me enough to work through my weakness. So preacher, why are you sharing this today? Because I know we've all been through this and I don't want you to feel like you're alone. And when your faith seems to be wrecked and you feel like you cannot go on anymore, I don't want you to give up thinking that God has turned His back on you because even when you're in the belly of the whale, even when you're or the belly of the great fish, even when you're in the furnace, the fire of the furnace, even when you're under the juniper tree, even when you're in the most discouraging or whatever tree it was, even when you're in the most discouraging times of your life, He's still God. I think of all these little children that have been going through this great sickness lately. As debilitating as these, these diseases have been, as sick as these children have been, their family still loves them even in their weak state. So of course he does. Of course they do. Well, I want you to know there's times that in my life I'm extremely weak and I can't go on anymore, but God still loves me. And the words I speak, even though sometimes I speak them in frustration and even some disbelief, it doesn't limit the power of God. Faith and belief are the condition that Jesus says, but Jesus understood when that man said, I believe you, God. He said, Preacher, are you teaching no faith? No, I'm not teaching that. I'm saying that even when your faith and my faith is weak, He's still God. That's what I'm trying to teach. Because sometimes we question God, and even though we may question God, it doesn't take away from His holiness. It doesn't take away from His omniscience and omnipresence, His omnipotence. It doesn't take away from who God is. This man standing in the very face of Jesus who sought Jesus because of His healing abilities, Jesus says, this happens with faith. And He says, oh, God, I believe that You are who You are, but there's a part of me that just struggles with that. And Jesus didn't say, well, you know what? Until you get your faith worked out, you're not going to get your son healed. Okay, until you get yourself back together and get yourself back in church and understand what the Bible means, don't bring that boy to me. You know what Jesus said? Jesus said, bring him here. In your shipwrecked faith, in your distraught, in your frustration, in your anger, in your sadness, in your discouragement, bring that boy to me. And Jesus healed the boy. Watch this. Even though the man was suffering a crisis of faith. Gideon... In Judges chapter 6, he said, I want you to leave my army. Gideon said, are you kidding me? <laughs> and God says, let me finish. I want you to leave my army, but I want you to do it with 300 people. And Jesus said, I, I, Gideon said, I know you're kidding me now. This was a man who communed with God on behalf of the people. And Gideon did this. Now watch, Gideon did this. He says, I believe you can deliver the enemy into your children. But help me with my unbelief by wetting my blanket and keeping the ground dry. And God did exactly that. And Gideon said, God, I believe you can help me overcome the enemy, but help me with my unbelief by keeping my blanket dry and letting 
the ground be saturated with water. And God did that. See, let me tell you what Gideon did. We often talk about his great accomplishments. We talk about the fleas, but we don't fully understand the fleas. You know what Gideon did? Gideon said, I believe you, God, but there's a part of me that really doubts 300 men can beat this great massive army. Help me with my unbelief. And God did exactly that. I'm not teaching question God. I'm not teaching. I'm teaching reality and that reality is found in the Word of God. There are times in my life where I am struggling, where I am weak, when I am tired and I know God is exactly who He says He is, but there's a portion of my flesh that is overwhelmingly influencing my spirit and says, is this real? Can He do this? Is He listening to you? Have you not done so wrong that He will not turn back to you again? And it just completely defeats me. But even in those times when I may not think God is hearing me, even in those times when my faith is completely destitute, God hears. He sees the condition. And not out of any obligation other than the fact He loves me, in my weakness, He's still God. Bring the boy to me. There are times when you and I are spent. There's times we feel like giving up. There are times that we're exhausted. But He's still God. And if you find yourself in that place today, I close by giving you just a simple three points. The first thing I'd encourage you to do is not ignore your weakness. Confess it to God. God, I can't do this. I don't even know, Lord, what I'm saying, God. I, I just, I'm struggling right now and believing that You can work this out. God, I'm struggling. Admit to God what you're going through. Ask God to reveal to you the root of your struggle. Is it maybe I've not spent enough time in your word? Lord, is there sin in my life that I'm dealing with? It's causing me to have this crisis of faith. God, please reveal it to me. And then ask God to help you with your unbelief. There's no doubt in my mind, either you're going through it or you've been through it, but there's times in our life when He's God, we're struggling to find Him. And we just need to confess to God, Lord, I believe you. But there's a part of me right now that's struggling and I want you to help me with that. Would you pray with me? Father, there's times in my life I wish I could say it never existed. I do. I, I really do desire it and wish that I could stand before these people and say I've never struggled. I've never worried. I've never doubted. Never been scared. Never been afraid. Never been bothered by anything. But God, that would be just one lie on top of the next, on top of the next. I find myself often like this Father. Searching for an answer. Going to different people, looking for that answer and not being able to find it and getting more frustrated. Calling out to You, knowing that You have the ability to do that. Knowing that it takes faith. God, I understand that. But I'm struggling with that at that time. And sometimes just giving up because I just don't think You are hearing me when Your Word teaches contrary that even in our difficult days, even when the Queen Jezebel is looking to kill us, even when the acidic fluid of the fish's stomach is eating away at us, even though we're trapped in the darkness, You still hear us. And then at those times in my struggle, instead of giving up, that's the time I continually need to pray and say, God, even though I do not feel You, even though I'm wondering where You're at, You're right here beside me like You promised. Help me through this crisis. Help me with my unbelief, Lord. I still need You to do. And God, we fill in the blank. Lord, as we walk out of here today, if we're in a crisis of faith or when we face one, help us not to throw in the towel and run away, but be like the Father and confess, Lord, I believe You. Help me with my unbelief. In Jesus, Your name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Thank you so much for being here today. Hope to see you back next week. Have a wonderful, beautiful...